Dr. Craig Evans a proper introduction. Uh, some of you I'm sure know Craig from his uh, time as a professor at uh, Houston Baptist University. He is far more widely known than just from Houston. Uh, he has taught at uh, McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. He has uh, taught at Trinity Western University in British Columbia for 21 years. Uh, he has uh, taught at uh, 13 years at the Divinity College of Acadia University, and uh, he was also a visiting fellow at Princeton Theological Seminary. He has his Ph.D. in Biblical Studies from Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. We'll forgive him for that, but uh, glad that he can bring all of that and so much more. He is the author and editor of more than 70 books. He's working on several right now. He just told us a few minutes ago about a 10-volume work that maybe he'll tell you about somewhere in this afternoon. But how blessed we are to have this man be the moderator for our panel, and he will introduce the other uh, panelists, the four, including our lecturer for tomorrow night. So Craig, welcome. Come on up. Let's give him a Texas welcome, will you please? All right. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, our special uh, guest for the weekend who will be giving the lecture tomorrow night is Professor Stephen Notley. I've known uh, Stephen, I'm not sure how long, 20 years anyway, maybe a little longer. He's the Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Christian Origins on the New York City campus of Nyack College since 2001, and director of the Graduate Program in Ancient Judaism and Christian Origins. Since 2016, he has served as the academic director of the Il Araj Excavation Project in its search for first century Bethsaida Julius, the lost city of the apostles. Of course, that's what we're going to hear about tomorrow night, and some of our conversation could uh, wade into that a little bit this afternoon as well. Dr. Notley received his PhD from the Hebrew University where he studied with the legendary David Flusser. Steve lived 16 years in Jerusalem with his wife and four children, during which time he was the founding chair of the New Testament Studies program at the Jerusalem University College. He's been directing groups of students and lay people to Israel and the Eastern Mediterranean region for 30 years. Steve continues collaborative research and publication with Israeli scholars in the fields of historical geography, ancient Judaism, and Christian origins. Among his list of publications, he co-authored uh, with Flusser the historical biography, The Sage from Galilee, Rediscovering Jesus' Genius, and with Anson Rainey, the monumental biblical atlas, The Sacred Bridge, Carta's Atlas of the Biblical World published in 2005, and with Zaev Safrai, Safrai at Bar Ilan, an annotated translation of Eusebius' important description of Roman Palestine called the Onomasticon, a trigot edition with notes mm -hmm. and commentary. He rejoined Safrai for their second work, a pioneering collection and translation of the earliest rabbinic parables that provide the literary and religious context for the parables of Jesus. And that book is entitled The Parables of the Sages in 2011. So I'd, I'd like to have uh, Professor Notley come on up, take his seat, and... Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. <clears throat> And it's my pleasure now to introduce to you Professor Lawrence, or Larry uh, Garrity, is an American academic who served as the second president of La Sierra University in Riverside, California from 1993 to 2007. He completed his undergraduate education in theology at Pacific Union College, his Bachelor of Divinity and Master of Arts in Religion from 
Andrews University and received a doctorate in biblical studies from Harvard University. Prior to his presidency at La Sierra University, he was president of Atlantic Union College, 1985 to 93. He's also served as president of the American Schools of Oriental Research. He has taught archaeology and religion at Andrews University. In 2007, he was recognized as Citizen of the Year in Riverside, California. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> it's amazing. Have you been in Riverside? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean. That's where it was in Riverside that I saw Star Wars in 1977. Wow. So I have a very fond association with that city. <laughs> <clears throat> he was born to, I was very young then, by the way. I was just, <laughs> he was born to missionary uh, parents in 1940 with his family. He lived in China, Burma, Hong Kong, Lebanon, England, <laughs> Germany, France, and Israel, and sometimes in the United States. <laughs> His PhD is in Syro-Palestinian archaeology with minor fields in Aramaic, Syriac, Classical Hebrew, Northwest Semitic philology, Old Testament history. He studied under George Ernest Wright and Frank Moore Cross. Some of you, of course, recognize those names, uh, legends in the field in their time. In 1968, he joined Siegfried Horn and Roger Boras at Tel Hishman. He served the first three seasons there as a field supervisor. In 1974, he became the director of the Hishban expedition, which culminated with a final season in 1976. In 1982, Larry Herr, uh, Oystein LaBianca, and he began the Madaba Plains project. In 1986, he was instrumental in forming the Archaeological Consortium of Adventist Colleges when he led a tour of students from the member schools to the Madaba Plains project dig, including the Umairi site. He is a longtime member of the American Schools of Oriental Research at Boston University. He became the organization's vice president in 1982 and was selected as its president on November 16, 2001, and a number of awards like the Fulbright in 1970 and the, e and the P. E. McAllister Outstanding Career Award in 2001, and a number of books. I'll mention just a few. Historical Foundations, Studies of Literary References to Heshban, uh, along with Leona Glidden Running in 1989. The Archaeology of Jordan and Other Studies, with uh, uh, Larry Herr in 1986, and the Pasca and the Origin of Sunday Observance, mm. uh, published in 1965. Please join us up here at the table. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And it's great to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Ortiz, biblical archaeologist with over 30 years of field experience who has traveled extensively throughout the Middle East. Dr. Ortiz is currently the co-director and principal investigator at Tel Gezer, professor of archaeology and biblical backgrounds at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, or simply SWIBITS and also serves as director of Southwestern's Tandy Institute for Archaeology. Dr. Ortiz's expertise is the use of archaeology to reconstruct the history of ancient Israel and the Second Temple period. That usually uh, references also the New Testament. His research focus is the archaeology of the Southern Levant. He is active in professional academic organizations and is a prolific lecturer and author. He has contributed to several books and monographs, such as The History of Ancient Israel, Do Historical Matters Matter to Faith, Critical Issues in Early Israelite History, Buried Hopes or Risen Savior, Archaeological and Historical Studies in Honor of Amahite Mazar, and The Future of Biblical Archaeology and Other Studies as well. He's currently working on the publications of Tel Gezer, as well as a book entitled Intersections of Archaeology and Biblical Interpretation. Uh, Dr. Ortiz has received his PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology from the University of Arizona in 2000. 
received before that an MA in Near Eastern Archaeology and Biblical Studies in 1994, an MA in Biblical History from Jerusalem University College in 1989, and a BA in Anthropology and Sociology from California State University in Los Angeles. Additional studies include New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and the Rothberg School of Overseas Studies and Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Steve has lived uh, in Israel for over four years and he spends most of his summers in the country. He is married to Beth and they have two teenage children, Rebecca and Nathaniel. They are members of the Church at the Cross where Dr. Ortiz serves as a deacon. In addition to his scholarly pursuits, he is passionate about teaching students and the church the relevance of the historical and cultural context in the proper interpretation of scripture. He is a frequent supply preacher and conference speaker. He has contributed to over 100 radio interviews, newspaper articles, and denominational publications. Steve, please join us up here at the table. <laughs> And finally, it gives me pleasure to introduce to you Scott Stripling, a native Texan with 36, <laughs> 36 years of experience serving professionally as a pastor, principal, superintendent, professor, development director, teacher, coach, bodybuilder, and more. Wow. <laughs> Currently serving as provost at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, Dr. Stripling began his career in college working uh, in college, working as a youth minister, then working in public education, then full-time professional ministry in Christian education, then a combination of public and private education and ministry. Former department chair of humanities at Wharton County Junior College. He's also taught at Houston Baptist University, Belhaven University, International Bible College, and Texas Southmost College, University of Brownsville. He Previously worked as director of development at the IDEA, IDEA Academy, helped co-found and served as principal of Covenant Christian Academy and served as teacher and or coach at Sugarland Middle School, Point Isabel ISD, and James Pace High School. An active archaeologist and a board member of the Near East Near East Archaeological Society, Dr. Stripling serves as Director of Excavations at Shiloh, Shiloh and served as Field Supervisor of the Atal El Hammam Excavation Project in Jordan from 05 to 10, Director of the Kerbet El Makatir Project since 2010, and Supervisor of the Jerusalem Temple Mount Salvage Project in Israel. A popular speaker and author of The Trowel and the Truth, The Guide to Field Archaeology in the Holy Land, uh, The Trowel and the Truth, Somebody Call 9-11, and numerous other publications. He has served on a variety of community, education, and ministry boards and organizations. He received his BA at, uh, uh, in Physical Education in English in 1984, UT Pan American. Master of Arts in English, 1988, UT Pan American. Master of Arts in Biblical Literature at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. PhD in Archaeology and Biblical History at Veritas International University and the Doctor of Ministry in Leadership at Vision International University. So Scott, join us up here at the table. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to ask uh, for our, mo uh, our panel discussion to get, away, get underway as moderator. I'm going to ask uh, Steve to make a few opening comments. Uh, if, if Steve, if you want to uh, say a little bit in anticipation, like an advertisement for your lecture tomorrow, that'd be great. But, <laughs> but you can broaden it if you wish to talk about, um, and this is why I think everybody is here, the interface, the, the connection uh, between this kind of work, uh, archaeological work, investigation, trying to unearth and recover the remains of human physical culture, and how it sheds light, or if it sheds light, on the biblical text, which is so often what motivates this kind of work in the first place. Then we'll get some conversation going 
um, some interaction with all of our panelists, and uh, I'll interject uh, a question from time to time to keep things moving along. But I'd like for you to take the first kick at the can and uh, get our conversation underway. Okay. Well, as you heard, I spent a number of years living in Israel, and one of the reasons I went to study there is I had uh, a suspicion that it would make a difference if I immersed myself in the culture, the language, the physical settings of the scripture. Uh, that were things that you couldn't always pick up from a long distance. Um, and that's, it took me a while, I was there 16 years. Uh, and I have to say that it left an indelible imprint in terms of how I read scripture. Um, and so to some extent, the, the work that we're doing today in terms of archeology, span uh, the excavations that uh, I'm involved with at El Araj on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Um, this is an area, and I'm, I'm going to argue tomorrow evening, that it's uh, that we've found the place of uh, Bethsaida, which is one of the primary cities uh, involved in Jesus' ministry. And I think it's always very helpful to understand something of the context in which uh, we have these biblical events taking place. It gives us insight. Sometimes we, we miss points there because we are, we're not present there or we are, we are not fully aware of the, the physical settings. I know that there are a number of episodes. I, I'm actually a minority up here. Uh, one, I'm a historian, primarily a historian, not an archeologist, although I am involved in archeological uh, research. And the other is that I primarily focus on New Testament. Uh, and so my, my concerns are, are uh, Second Temple period history. That's a Jewish frame of reference uh, that, which overlaps in the New Testament period. And I'm, I'm interested in the historical aspects of, of that history and how it sheds light on our understanding of the Gospels and the, the beginnings of Christianity. Uh, but also in, in that, looking at that history, it's oftentimes very important to understand the physical stage on which it, it plays out, uh, because it can nuance how we read the accounts, uh, give us insights, and, and not just archaeology, but you can think in terms of, of agriculture. A lot of times the prophets and Jesus will use uh, agriculture as metaphors for their message. So there are all kinds of aspects that sort of couch the, 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 the biblical account that, that nuance the, the message that it's contained within the scriptures. And I think archaeology is part of that. Yeah. I would define myself primarily as an historical geographer, uh, which is a multidisciplinary approach that brings together language, history, archaeology, toponymy, the study of place names. Uh, all of those sort of come together uh, and, and sort of shed light uh, on the, the biblical count, not just the biblical count, I'd say also Josephus or any other writers in, in, in the period that I'm interested in or that I'm focused on, uh, particularly in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, uh, but I would say the same thing probably in the, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament period as well, the importance of all those elements in terms of shedding light on the, the biblical accounts. Very good. Thank you for that opening comment. Uh, panelists, anybody like to uh, add to that uh, or your own, your own insights and from your own experience and study and publications? Well, I, I got into the field also because of my background in Bible and my interest in what more we could learn. And really, archaeology is the only source for new information about the Bible in many ways, isn't it? And so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience to be involved in that and to come across things that help us understand the Bible better. I spent my teenage years um, living in Lebanon, and yep. um, my, my parents were missionaries there. And that's sort of where I watched archaeologists at work, and I thought, now that would be an interesting career, uh, interested in the Bible and seeing how they, were, they found things. And so, like, like most of us here, I think we, we probably got our start because of an interest in the Bible and wanting to know more about it. And I actually got started at Gezer, where you're working now. That was my first field experience with uh, Deaver back in the 60s, and uh, that was a great way to get started. Very good, thank we, you. We just yeah. got a new, um, <coughs> I'm from Southwestern Seminary. We have a new president, new provost. Uh, two weeks ago, I get called into the provost office and, to meet him, and uh, he naturally asked me, they're doing budget cuts, <laughs> why do we need archeology? span 
And I looked at him, I said, have you read the Bible? <laughs> and I was going to introduce some, you know, why we need archaeology. And, and he took me to the back, like, why are you telling me ever, you know, the progress of Southwest and I read the Bible? But my point was, it's a historical text. Yeah. I, I, I go, I'm interested in the Bible, but to understand the text, the message, you have to understand the historical context and the geographical context. And I think a lot of us were more interested in studying God's Word. And then when we realized God's Word is so full of historical knowledge, mm-hmm. okay, for me to understand this text better, I have to understand the history better. Because mm-hmm. apparently the authors and um, the audience were aware of, they went to site A, they went to site B, they did this, they, they mentioned these kings. You know, if you don't understand the history before, you're not going to understand the text or even be able to preach the text. Mm-hmm. And so I think I still have a job, and I'll find out when I <laughs> go, back to, go back up north to Fort Worth. Uh, but I was just at a, I just came back from Israel at an archaeology conference uh, on state formation and the history of David. And it was funny because every archaeologist there said, well, we're really historians. Uh, we want to tell the story. Now, Steve is more interested um, we got guess two Steves here. I'll be the good-looking one. You be the other one. So, well, yeah. You're the. You're, I'm the coatless one. You're the you're one. That, okay. And I have the tie. Are you know. okay? Um, the only difference is Steve will study the historical text, the history, and we study the material culture. But at some point, we come to the same table, and we're interested in reconstructing the past. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the, like the difference here. So Steve also does archaeology because he's interested in reconstructing the past. It's just my expertise is in pottery and stratigraphy, and his is in reading. Archaeologists don't know how to read, so we, <laughs> we get dirty. Amen. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Luke 1940, Jesus said, if these would not praise me, the stones would cry out. And I realize I'm taking a little bit of license with the text, but the <laughs> artifacts over time begin to talk to us. Uh, once we learn the pottery and, and the other aspects of the material culture, it has a language, and, and we can then date it with a, a high degree of accuracy. We take then the written, so I mean, the, the text is a type of artifact, and if we take that along with the material culture, and we have several different metrics that are coming together, it enables us to lay out a solid chronology, and I think that's sort of where the study of history is going is do we have a means by which we can accurately understand what was happening in a in a time period in many cases the bible is giving us a headline and we can find what underlies that through the study of archaeology and then in a larger sense uh, anthropologically and sociologically uh, as well my motivation was similar to the rest of the of the panel um, I was a Bible reader I was a committed Christian and I wanted to explore the material culture of the world of the Bible and you know how one one door opens up to another uh, that's sort of what led us to where we are at this point yeah, yeah. oh very good uh, I wanted to throw in a, a, my own thought along this line I'm very much a manuscripts Hmm. person, and I don't mean uh, text uh, that's abstracted, but when I refer to manuscripts, I mean the actual ancient manuscripts that we find, whether they relate to the Old Testament or First Testament, uh, or interesting texts that never were included in the canon but are quite old, such as most of the texts found at Qumran. I actually had the privilege of studying with Bill Brownlee and John Trevor, uh, two, of the, two of the three scholars who were the very first to see the scrolls in 1947 and uh, 1948. Uh, Bill and John just happened to be rooming together and happened to be there at post docs when they were about 30 years old and that's when the scrolls from Cave One came to light. So that makes me uh, one of the youngest second generation. <laughs> uh, most of the second generation's dead, but here I am, I'm still here. And, uh, but it was exciting to um, see John's photographs, to hear the stories, uh, like Bill Brownlee, for one semester as a new appointment in the fall of 1948, had the great Isaiah scroll in a shoebox. Mm-hmm. Uh, with him and showing it to his Hebrew students. Now that was a rare thing. You can't do that now. <laughs> and uh, I relayed that story on one occasion and talked about uh, 
Emmanuel Gitlin, his uh, uh, young, he, Bill wasn't even married yet, he was staying in a dorm and an un, with an undergraduate uh, student who had a car and drove him around with this great Isaiah scroll in a shoebox to various churches and places in North Carolina back when he was at Duke to show, to show it. And I actually related that, relayed that story just over 20 years ago in North Carolina, and an elderly gentleman jumped up and said, that was me. I was the guy driving Professor Brownlee around. I about fell out of my chair. But that's what I like. I like texts, and uh, they tell stories too. They're artifacts, mm. and uh, that understanding that uh, a long time ago mm. transformed my appreciation for textual criticism. And it, it itself, textual criticism, understood rightly and chronologically, is almost like a tell mm. that you work through and as the scribes wrestle with it. So we have artifacts that aren't just made out of stone or metal unearthed, but uh, old text mm. too that tell us a lot of things about the text mm. and how it was understood and transmitted. And Craig, I can sort of springboard off of that. I, one of the first questions for me is, which has primacy, the written text or the archaeological material? And I think that's something that we all grapple with. We want to arrive at an accurate conclusion. How do we weigh those out? Because sometimes they're apparently in conflict with one another. Which has primacy? Um, I personally look to the written text, particularly the biblical text. I would take on the same par as any other historical text, which puts us outside the mainstream of many archaeologists in that we are taking the Bible as a serious historical document, along with literature from, from Ugaritic literature or Egyptian text or whatever. We're, we're looking at the Bible as a reliable historical document. Um, maybe there's gaps in our understanding that are cultural or textual type issues. So I begin with the text, and I'm taking the, the biblical text in particular seriously. We're excavating at Shiloh. Shiloh is not mentioned in Egypt. It's not me mentioned in Mesopotamia. We only know it from, from the Bible uh, in the ancient world. And so, of course, we have to take the, the biblical text very seriously. And so that's an interesting question about the interface between archaeology and history is which has primacy, the, the artifact of the text. Anyone Sometime. panelists want to comment on that? I mean, that, that's a touchy question because right. minimalists will wade in and say, you guys uh, give too much mm -hmm. credibility, too much weight for Scripture. You have a theological dog in the fight. And uh, I, I don't agree with that assessment, but that's my view. Larry? Yeah, I think that uh, it's sort of popular to think of archaeology proving the Bible true sometimes, and um, it certainly has demonstrated the historical accuracy of Scripture in many, many ways. But I like to talk more about the preponderance of the evidence, you know, and wh where does that lead you mm -hmm. in your understanding of Scripture? But I think many of us come out of the background of uh, what's called the Albright School, William Foxwell Albright, who grew up as a missionary kid in Chile, and uh, he went off to study in Germany and a very higher critical kind of uh, situation. But as he worked in the field for many years, he was the director of the Jerusalem School, uh, he came to appreciate how historically accurate scripture really was. And so uh, many of his students who, who got into the field because of their interest in the Bible, I think, uh, came to be known as people who uh, took the Bible seriously and found archaeology really helpful in, in understanding the Bible. Uh, I guess I'm part of the second generation that you mentioned too because uh, several of my professors were involved with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Frank Cross, you know, was certainly one of the um, leaders in publishing and uh, I got to work with some of the texts that he had, and um, uh, Yadin was one of my teachers, and of course he published the Temple Scroll from uh, one of the most complete uh, manuscripts. And I had DeVoe as a teacher, and he was the one who excavated at Qumran. So um, I don't know about comparative age, but I guess I'm there with you as part of the, the <laughs> second, second generation. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're two different questions. One, as a, as a believer, I, I hold to the authority of Scripture, mm -hmm. 
As a scholar, I'm doing different things when I look at the biblical text as a historical document. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, the conquest and settlement. There are nearly 400, 500 sites mm -hmm. that we have, and not all of them are mentioned in the Bible, but they're Israel. These are real people. These are the Israelites who mm -hmm. settled the hill country. As an archaeologist, I'm talking about stuff that's not in the biblical text itself, but it's part of biblical history. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I get to this, I get in this debate with my colleagues, you know, back at the seminary. Well, do we really need archaeology? We just have the Bible. Does archaeology <laughs> help? And I would say yes. If I'm preaching, I don't preach stratigraphy. I don't preach red slate burnished pottery and uh, <laughs> my known cups. I preach the gospel. <laughs> it's separate. But if I'm teaching and I'm trying to teach students how to accurately handle God's word, the archaeologist is at the bottom level. It's what we do that historical reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a, I wrote an article in uh, this collection of essays, and uh, I forget the name of the book, but it just came out last year. Um, uh, and a student came up and goes, I read your archaeology article. And I looked at him, I said, I go, I didn't write the archaeology article. I wrote the biblical <laughs> article on the United Monarchy based on literary and archaeological texts. I go, Ami Mazar wrote the archaeology article. And I, I was teaching the student, the, the difference. articles are different. I'm right, I'm summarizing the archaeology and the biblical texts and presenting a historical reconstruction. And the student was interested in our archaeology program. I go, that's the difference. I'm training students how to do the archaeology. But my goal is to understand the history and then understand the text. I, I mean, I would echo that. I mean, on, on one level, when I'm reading the text, I'm reading it in a position of faith. Someone has a deep sense of faith and have lived my life accordingly. Um, I, I actually like to frame the question more broadly than just scripture and archaeology or Bible and archaeology. My experience in the interface as an historian with archaeologists at times, I can remember, and I'll maybe share a little bit more about this tomorrow evening, about the excavator at the other site, at, at Tell, at the alternate site. And I, we were in a conversation about, um, about their excavation, and I I made reference to Josephus and Josephus' description and how I didn't sense that it matched what they were digging. And his response to me was immediate. Josephus exaggerated. And I, and I said, well, that's what makes you different than me because I take quite seriously the, I mean, this is a person who walked in the streets and had an eyewitness uh, to the physical setting. And for those, I take those that description seriously in terms of my uh, trying to understand that integration in the physical remains, the archaeological remains, and the historical record. So it's the question that you ask in terms of sort of archaeology and Bible is, is part of a larger, I would, I would argue it's part of a larger discussion about how do we integrate the witness, the eyewitness accounts, it, you know, if they are eyewitness accounts, it's certainly much closer to the event than we are. Uh, and they're giving uh, descriptions. Sometimes they are eyewitness accounts, but they, they're giving descriptions of, of settings and, and events. And the, the question is, how do we interface that? How do we hold that together with the material remains that we're mm -hmm. excavating out? So it's, a, it's for me, it's, a, it's, it's at the crux. And we have this argument all summer long because I'm surrounded by archeologists. And we have this conversation about uh, you know, they're usually disparaging historians. We're disparaging archaeologists. <laughs> you know, they say you you historians have your heads in the clouds. You have no touch with reality. And I say you archaeologists can't read. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I said worse, you don't read. And that's and they. But we and, can read pottery at least. You can read pottery. <laughs> yes. But they, so it's there's a there's a natural tension, and I think it's a healthy tension actually mm -hmm. that goes on uh, back and forth between. I think we both. Both disciplines have something to gain and to learn in that, in that interplay between those two disciplines, back and forth. So it's the, and you know, I, I grapple, as I think others do as well, at times when you find physical remains and the biblical text, and there's a tension there. How do I understand that? How do I find those, um, uh, you know, touching or coordinating together? Sometimes I can't connect the pieces. 
And I, I, sometimes I have to walk away. I say, I don't know. I, don't, I, I see this. I have this on one hand and I have this on the other hand. I, I don't yet have enough information to be able to resolve that tension. And I think there, at least for me, I'll just speak for myself, that's where humility kicks in. And you say, you know, there's a limit to what I know today. Maybe I'll find something, you know, six months later, a year later, that will, and that actually does happen. I'll come back and something will click and those things come together. And I think there's a certain process where you have to be humble enough to say, I, I don't see these things connecting, but I'm not going to force them to connect. I'm going to, I'm going to step back and let it be for now. This is what I see and hope that later I'll have more data, either physical or sometimes language kicks in. Uh, I'm not reading it quite how it needs to be read. And those things find, resolve themselves. And we have the concept of canon. The, the end of the Gospel of John it says all of Jesus' miracles cannot be recorded. Mm-hmm. The writer is suggesting that there's a lot more that were written down in the Gospels. <clears throat> and that's history. That's, our Lord did other things besides what's only recorded in those four Gospels. And that's what historians look at. Now, I don't think that's, I'm not adding to scripture. It, I just know that there's other things that happened during the time of Jesus. I have to, you know, our students or young people, they're looking at Hollywood to define scripture. So when they sure. talk about the Exodus, it's all these movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's Veggie Tales. They grew up on Veggie Tales. And it's like, <laughs> okay, that's a cartoon, but that's not history. You got to go mm-hmm. back to the biblical text. You have to go back to the historical context to reconstruct things. And a lot sure. of times we're fighting what Hollywood's you know, because we're visual, you know, the West is visual now, and so that's kind of influencing how these events happened. And I'll give you a brief example. We don't have a record of Jesus visiting Shiloh, but we know he passed right by. Mm -hmm. And his mission was to reach these cities and villages, so we assume that he did. We have stone vessels, we have coins, we have early Roman pottery, we have mikvot, we have everything that's that's there but it's not mentioned in the new testament but we can logically surmise historically we can fill in a gap and say that very likely the preponderance of evidence is that jesus did visit shiloh and it certainly gives the context for his ministry even if it doesn't mention that he was there yet the things that you find illustrate the kinds of things that he did when he was passing through how he lived so forth, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, one of the interesting uh, controversies on this very subject involving the Jesus Seminar mm-hmm. was Sephoris, which or Tsipuri, just four miles away from Nazareth. And there was the interesting proposal that Jesus fell under the influence of these Hellenized Jews that lived just four miles away from where I grew up. And because of the building program at the beginning of the first century by Tetrarch, and to pass, no doubt, Jesus from a family of builders or carpenters or whatever would have worked there. So on and on and on. It was an interesting house of cards that was built up, mostly by John Dominic Crossan. And there was this assumption, because archaeologists were find, finding Hellenistic-looking archaeology or architecture, that uh, it probably was teeming with Hellenized thinking people. And of course, if there are Hellenized thinking people, there had to be cynics. <laughs> and so Jesus fell under the influence of cynics and on and on and on and went, but archeology span destroyed it. Mm-hmm. Not because archeologists said, let's go to Sepphoris and see if we can find cynics. They just did their work, they did their stratigraphy, they found garbage dumps that were pre-70, and it's a totally cash root society pre-70. There isn't anything that would indicate a non-Jewish way of living. Mm-hmm. Right. And it just destroyed the theory. Mm-hmm. Instead, well, they appear to be Torah observant, uh, mikveh type Jewish people that take the law and their faith seriously. And just like that, the pre-70 Hellenism began to evaporate, and all the cynics went yipping and yapping away and just disappeared. Mm -hmm. I think you've made a good point that sometimes we have to be patient. You mentioned being humble, but we have to be patient too because later work is going to have an impact on what we currently believe, perhaps mistakenly, you know. So we always have to be open to new new light. I started excavating Tal Gez in 2006, and my co-director, Sam Wolf, 
um, you know, Southwestern funded it, and we get to the site. And the site is famous because of a Solomonic gate. Mm -hmm. And there's debates, revisionists, that this doesn't date to the time of Solomon, et cetera. And he asked me, Steve, what would happen if this isn't Solomonic's gate? Would we still get funding? Would you get fired from being <laughs> Baptist? And I looked at him, I said, well, one, the Bible doesn't say it's Solomon's gate. <laughs> I go, archaeologists have said that. You know, we found three gates at Megiddo, Hatzor, and we go to 1 Kings 9.15, and it's a famous, you know, textbook case. I go, but if this, date, if this gate dates to the 9th century, then I'll just say, okay, Solomon's gate is under it. You know, this, this is archaeology. It does not say he built this. And even there, at this conference, I gave a paper on the Solomonic gate in the administrative center. And I don't think Solomon was ever at Gezer. The Bible never says he was. We call it Solomon's Gate because it was built under his auspices as the king. Uh, mm. Trump's building a wall, but I, I doubt he's ever been on the border. It, mm. It's, you know, presidents, kings build things, but they don't actually go to that site. He's up in mm. Jerusalem, Solomon, with, busy with his wives. And, you know, other people <laughs> are, are building the gate. And so after you have to tell students, and we'll have tour guides come and walk where Solomon walked. And mm. I don't want to say anything because I want to raise money for the site, but it's like <laughs> he, he never walked there. <laughs> One of the things that you have an advantage of is, though, nobody's ever disputed the fact that Gezer is Gezer, mm. right? Oh, because well, of yes, inscriptions. Because, yeah. Yeah, inscriptions. Yeah, we have yeah. all kinds of reasons to say. Some of the other sites that we've worked at, there is a dispute. Mm -hmm. Is this really you know, the site that we say it is, and we have to uh, tend with that, but at least you have a site that everybody agrees is Gezer. <laughs> and we talked about this earlier, where archeologists, we, we love the history. And mm -hmm. once you have written text, all of a sudden, you get more data out of those texts. And mm -hmm. so all the great archeological discoveries <laughs> are actually written text and not pottery. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. We have excavated first century roofing tile, clay tiles, tegula and bricks, typical roof tile. In Luke's gospel, <clears throat> he uses the word karamas in the story of breaking through the roof and lowering their friend to Jesus at, at Capernaum. Well, it's indicating there was a ceramic roof. Well, if you read the, the archaeological textbooks and materials, there were no ceramic roof tiles in the first century, okay? Uh, based largely on what was found in the Jewish quarter in Jerusalem. But that idea became pervasive, so when we began to find them, the experts were telling me they can't be because they don't exist. And I said, but we have them in a clean context. We went back to excavation reports at other digs, and they'd been tossing them out, saying, mm. well, it can't be. Mm. And so the Bible turned out to be historically accurate in that, in that sense, and the archaeology had sort of a, a circular reasoning that was going on. So there's many fit, uh, pitfalls, I think, as we're trying to do proper um, epistemology, how are we acquiring knowledge, and then turning that ultimately into history. What's the date of those? Mid-first century. A.D. Okay. So you should keep your eye out for a minute. Uh, Raj. Let me put a question to all of you and yeah. uh, take your turn and, and speak to it. Uh, I was intrigued by Larry's comments just a moment ago. Uh, how do archaeologists identify or at least try to identify sites where no name does appear? There is no inscription. You might think it's AI. You might think it's you know, this or that or the other thing, but uh, you just don't find that, you know, welcome to AI or <laughs> welcome to Ephraim. You just don't find that population, you know, whatever. So what do you look for or what are the kinds of things that you might find, whether mm. written or what you unearth, that encourage you that, you know what, I think this place probably is whatever. I'd like to hear you speak to that. I'll jump in first. The, uh, the whole, and that's the crux of the, our discussion tomorrow evening because we're discussing, and I try to present our excavations under the larger umbrella of what we call site identification. How do you, and most people are, how many people here have been to Israel before? Anyone been there before? So when you get off, you get off the plane, you get on the bus, you go, you're taken around the country, and you get off the bus, the tour guide, you go past, there's a sign there, you're at Caesarea, you're at uh, Nazareth, you're at Capernaum, you, and you get off, you maybe take a picture of yourself 
provide the sign, you know, so your friends can know that you've been to these biblical places. No one ever stops to ask the question, uh, is, how do we know this is the site? And most people, that's actually how I start my lecture tomorrow evening, is about lost cities of the Bible. Hmm. And most people don't realize that almost all of the site, almost all of our biblical sites were destroyed, abandoned, and forgotten. And really, we're in, the, we're in a process that began in, in pretty much the, in the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Explorers began to come out, and they began to sort of, and that was before archaeology. Mm -hmm. They're reading texts, they're reading descriptions uh, of accounts, both biblical and, and extra-biblical, descriptions of events or settlement or things, and they start trying to match those with the sites that they're visiting on horseback, not a bus. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also, they use toponymy, uh, because many times the, um, the, the names stick, the names hold on, they may be remembered in, in Arabic, uh, and so, but they'll, there are similarities and there's a certain correspondence between them. Uh, one top of my head, El Jib, which is Gibeon, and so you, you have these sort of similarities and people who know how to, to do that correspondence between the, the Arabic name that, that remembers the site and the biblical name, they'll use that. Again, there's geography that comes into play. There may be some aspect of uh, an event or settlement. Let's say if you have a description of settlement or destruction, I know that's something that you talk about, the destruction layers that we have. So we should find, if we, if we mention, we find in historical documents, there's destruction at a particular time or settlement at a particular time, we should find evidence of that. We should find material evidence in the archaeological uh, remains of it. And so archaeology is sort of the last, last of many stages in terms of toponymy, the place names, geography, um, the witnesses, and, and archaeology, again, sometimes has corrected those suggestions that happened in the 19th century uh, that were put forward, and then and they found out later, nope, it was someplace else. Uh, so there, we're still in the process. I like to try not to be too Hollywood-esque, but I say that we're, we're in search of the last lost city of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, it's a, and it's hard to explain to people how these sites get lost. Very, very rare. You had Tel Mikne, Tel Akadi at, at Dan. Um, there, there are not that many sites that are confirmed with an inscription. Mm -hmm. That's actually the rarity. Mm -hmm. It's, everybody hopes for it, but it's very rare that you have, uh, I would think. I, I wouldn't understand what you're saying, because I've worked at Tel Mikna and I found the inscription. <laughs> and we worked at Gezer in the inscription, so I think I'm the only one up here on this panel that's <laughs> actually found the name of the city at their site. But. Can you come? Dig with <laughs> yeah. <us? Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, but that's no, those no, are rare. No, it is rare, yes. Those yes, are very yes, rare. rare. Most sites are not confirmed. Right. right. And for instance, I don't want to shake everybody up, but as an historian, when I read Josephus describe Capernaum and talk about the springs of Capernaum, there are no springs of Capernaum. Uh, so there's, and so the question is, how do I reconcile the description of something that I, and there's no, so there's, there, there are a lot of factors that come in, and by the way, I, I'm okay with Capernaum being Capernaum, so I, <laughs> but I'm saying that there sometimes are disconnects yeah. between these, and mm. you have to sort of, so very rarely do we sort of have an inscription, a name of a place, we can say, okay, we can all rest easy, this is really the place. Well, oh. and sometimes in 2,000 years, springs and streams do close change. Up. They, they do, close up, they Absolutely. do change. Sure. Yeah. The term I would use is a criterial screen. When we're going to a new site or we're looking at a, a site name, can we set out dispassionately a criterial screen? What source do we have? Is it the Bible or is it another ancient text? And what does it tell us topographically, geographically? And let's lay out that screen and pass our site through it. And it may not check all the boxes, but if it has uh, a, a lot of them, it's something we want to then investigate further. Um, we, to complicate things, at Shiloh, we do have an inscription in one of the churches there, but that's Byzantine era. Did the Byzantines have it right? Uh, with Shiloh, well, what Robinson did in the 18, uh, mid, eight, mid uh, 19th century, he took the biblical account, and it's very specific, and it says exactly where Shiloh was located, and it led him to 
Tirbit Silun, and you know, there's later inscriptions confirm that. So in his case, the Bible led him directly to the site. I have an interesting example too, the site where we've worked for a long time, uh, Heshban. Mm -hmm. um, the Arabic term is Hisban, so there's yep. a, certainly a linguistic, you know, correlation mm -hmm. between the Hebrew and the Arabic, and nobody had ever questioned that that wasn't biblical Heshban until Siegfried Horn chose to excavate it beginning in 1968. And we do have Roman uh, milestones mm -hmm. leading up to the site that talk about Espus, the Greco-Roman mm -hmm. name for the site. Um, we found a coin that was in mint condition that was minted at Espus, uh, not necessarily a proof, but um, there, there, there were, uh, Frank Cross translated one of the ostraca that we found, which is a broken piece of pottery with writing on it, to Heshban, that that's the way it began. There's some dispute about whether that's the way it should be translated or not, but anyway, Everybody thought that that was Heshbon, but as we excavated, we, we couldn't find anything earlier than 1200 BC. And yet, according to the count in numbers, this was the first site that the Israelites took after they came out of their wilderness wanderings and came, came into Transjordan. They fought Sihon, the Amorite king, whose capital was Heshbon. Mm -hmm. You know, the story is really clear. But you know, that would be what we would call a late Bronze Age time, mm. and we had nothing before Iron One, which we typically associate with, with the Israelites. So, uh, where was that Heshbon? It seems like it's Heshbon in later periods, Greco-Roman times, mm. no question, uh, maybe even back into the Iron Age. We, we excavated a huge reservoir there, and it was dated to the 10th century on the basis of pottery, and we like to think maybe that's what the Song of Solomon refers to, your eyes are like the pools at Heshbon by mm -hmm. the gate of Bat Rabim. Well, we, we found a reservoir that could be that, you know, uh, certainly that time. But what about the earlier site? And that's still a conundrum, you know, where could, could the site have been this in later periods, but mm -hmm. the site that belonged to Sihon the Amorite, maybe it was a regional name, maybe uh, that site went out of use and so <coughs> the name moved to, to a, you know, a, a later site. There are lots of options, but it's open question whether... Yeah. Yeah. Archaeologists what, rely on historians. We, we look yeah. at history. I mean, truth mm -hmm. be told, it's not... You don't go to an unknown site. It's usually yeah. you're interested in a historical question or reconstructing yeah. history, mm -hmm. and that's what draws us. Well, my example comes from outside of the biblical text. The government of Kazakhstan called up the Tandy Institute, and mm -hmm. somebody discovered a stone with a cross on it in Aramaic. And up in you know, the Kazakh territory on the border with China and, and Kazakhstan. <laughs> And they just looked for, they just, I guess, did a Google search, Christian and archaeology, and we came up. So, um, <laughs> but the government wanted us, there's this lost city, uh, Ilibalik, mm -hmm. and it mentions a bishop there and these Christians, and they wanted us to find this church. And so my colleague uh, and I are out in Kazakhstan, and the government's asking us to find a church. And we're like, you can't, it's two miles, this city's two miles, twice the size mm. of the old, old city of Jerusalem. And we finally said, look, we have a dead Christian. Let's look for more dead Christians. And mm. we can find, we don't have to find the church, but if you have several dead Christians, we know that there was a Christian community here. And that's how we can associate it. And that's what we're doing. We're getting only pieces of a puzzle, historical texts, the archaeological record, and we're trying to reconstruct the past. And Sure enough, we think we found this ancient city, Ilibelic. We know there was a bishop there. We know there's a large Christian community. I think we've, um, after two seasons, we have nine dead Christians. And so <laughs> one more and we have a Baptist church. So <laughs> but um, but we're, we're trying to, that's our research design. We're looking at, we go like, why don't we excavate the necropolis, the, the cemetery. Sure. And sure enough, we took our, you know, Old Testament expert there, and he goes, 
it's nonsense to me, I can read it, and it's the ancient Turgic language, but because it was sacred, they're using the text of the Bible, and these are probably the mm. Nestorians of the Church of the East, mm. taking the Hebrew text into Aramaic, and because this is sacred, you know, somebody dying, they, they use this script, but it was in a different language, so we had to go get an expert, but, you know. Didn't read. But that's what we do. We take the bits and pieces, it's usually starting with history, and there on the Silk Road, we think we found this ancient city that united others. And hmm. it'd be nice to find this large church with the bishop and everything, but we have enough with some dead bodies, too. Many people don't realize that the end of the Silk, Silk Road uh, in China, Xi'an, mm -hmm. the um, museum there has a number of tablets with Ch yeah, Chinese yes, yes. inscriptions, but in the margins are the Christian uh, sort of notations in Syriac. The early Christian missionaries that came from the Middle East went to China, converted, and uh, we have a record of, of that at the end of the Silk Road, so it's a fun thing. Right, and now we're adding another city. That's uh, right. Yeah, we, yeah. we know where they On ended the, up. Yeah. Uh, right and that's right. what a lot of times what we do with history. We, we find, okay, we, uh, you mentioned Shiloh, okay, we mm -hmm. know this site, we know this site. Some text says it's between these two sites, right. and the, you know. You right. send students to walk out and find the site. <laughs> so I'd like to ask Steve a, a question and uh, sort of to lay the predicate. When we were looking at the lost city of Livius, which falls then within your area of interest, uh, we did lay out a criterial screen and then uh, published in peer-reviewed journals on our research. Um, Levant in 2010, 2011, I published uh, there, what our research was, and I believe that we had, had identified a lost city. And then that gives scholars the ability to really weigh it out. It's now been cited widely by many scholars that this very well may be that lost city of Olivius. Now, of course, this becomes to interplay, Steve, with uh, Arraj, because you're looking at the deification of Livia, the wife of uh, one emperor, the mother of another emperor, very important person. So um, this is quite controversial, and Josephus gives us an account of, uh, after her deification, Philip's desire to build a temple uh, to honor her. So my question is, taking that Josephus text and what you guys are uncovering at El Arraj, is can you see a, a temple of that magnitude being built at Arraj, or does that fit better at Etel, the traditional site? First of all, he didn't live very long after uh, Philip, uh, Philip establishes, the, at least what we assume, that he establishes, founds that city probably mm -hmm. around 30, something like that, mm -hmm. if we think in terms mm -hmm. of that. So he doesn't, he doesn't live that long, so we don't know to the extent. This enters into the whole question of the polis. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, what, this is a Greek word, polis, is city, but it has certain assumptions about it. It's, um, it's the Greco-Roman city that would, you would assume has certain um, institutions in it, certain things, perhaps a theater, perhaps um, you know, other elements from Greco-Roman culture that are being sort of uh, uh, put in place there. So there's a question about whether we have no, I don't know of any reference to, um, to a temple being built there for... Uh, by this time, they're calling her Julia. Uh, she, Livia becomes, she becomes part of the, uh, the genes, the Julius genes, and she, she enters, she's deified uh, at the death of, of um, Augustus. Uh, when he dies, she's deified, and she's, uh, so that's where we get uh, Bethsaida Julia. Mm. We don't know yet, in terms of what was there, that is a constant conversation with us. What makes a, if I can put it like this, what, and this is a conversation that Moti and I have regularly, what, uh, what makes a Jewish polis? Uh, we only have two or three examples in Roman Judea, land of Israel, of villages that become a polis, become a, are, tra are transformed, go from a village to a city. And what is, Sephiris is one of those, Tibori. Uh, so there, there's a question of what, what are the components? What defines that as a city? And that's a constant conversation. But I know of no reference at our site 
the mentioning of a temple, uh, whether there is or not. I mean, we have Tiberius. We don't, uh, the question is, do we have a temple in Tiberius? No, I'm saying Josephus mentions Philip's intention to build it at Bethsaida. A temple to Julia? To the deified Ju Livia Julia. But we don't know if he ever managed to do it, but you're yeah. right on that. I, he died just a few years after. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, I mean, we have the question, the, and of course, Rami thinks he has the, uh, up there he has a structure, a Roman period structure, which he suggests is a temple. I, I would disagree with that in terms of the assessment. And I'm not alone in that assessment of that sure. structure. But I don't, know, uh, I don't know whether we would find a temple there or find, uh, you know, Moti expects to find a theater there, expects mm -hmm. to find, uh, but I don't, I don't know of any temple. I, I'm not expecting to find a temple to Julia, okay. to Livia Julia. Is there a paradigm that can incorporate Ethel and Araj both into a no. police? No. They're mutually exclusive. That's an old idea. That, well, there is an, uh, not that is an old idea. There was an old idea that we have uh, one is, uh, one is uh, Bethsaida and one is Julia. And they, uh, but that's not actually how Josephus reads. Josephus actually reads that, Ju uh, that Bethsaida was, was made into yes. Julia. It's, mm -hmm. it's not two different ones separate. One is transformed into the other. And that's the, and he, I don't want to, I don't know, maybe these people won't be back tomorrow night, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can talk a little bit about it, but there's, there are, he, he talks about two things that makes it into a city, and that, and the, one of them is the uh, bringing inhabitants, increasing the population, and the other is a very interesting, and I actually think not yet fully unpacked, he, he talks about the, he raises its stature by, bringing dunamis, and what does that mean? Most translations are fortifications. Uh, what, do, what exactly is he uh, contributing to the city that, that leads to that transformation? But the, certainly a temple would not, I mean, it's not outside of uh, the realm of possibility because it seems that he, we have, that area is marginal enough that they can, uh, you could have temples to you know, foreign dignitaries, mm -hmm. you have, that's what Harry the Great does, of course, but he does it always in marginal areas, does it in Caesarea, uh, does it in Sebastia, so mm -hmm. he doesn't do it in areas of high Jewish population, mm -hmm. so uh, Herod Antipas, I mean, not Herod Antipas, Herod Philip could uh, possibly have done that. Mm -hmm. It's typically thought, though, that most of that kind of work happens in the northern part of his kingdom, not in the southern part. Uh, he's very careful in terms of the southern part where there's tends to be more of a Jewish population. Craig, I'm going to take your question yeah. in a different direction. Please. Plus, I'm getting bored of this New Testament <laughs> discussion. So, you know, um, even the biblical authors are aware of history. Um, there's, because I work at Gezer, there's one text where David has his battle, where the Philistines come up in uh, 1 Samuel, Baal Perizim. And there's a, a phrase where David chased him down from Geba to Gezer. Well, in later biblical texts, it's um, Gibeon together in later prophets. And it's, critical scholars will say, look, here's an error in the Bible. They got the cities wrong. Mm -hmm. And people will look at, you know, you know uh, Gimel, Baith, and Rash, and, you know, they'll try, noon, and they'll try to change the endings and try to figure out. And as an archaeologist and a historian, I go, no, one was earlier. And then they later, that city went out of use, and the new city was there. It's sort of like, you know, when I see Scott in Jerusalem, and people ask, where are you from? Where do you work? He doesn't say Katy, he says Houston. Because nobody knows that term. Mm -hmm. You know, not even in Houston do they know where Katy's at. So, you know, <laughs> it's like, they, but for us, it, it means the same thing. We're not saying he's lying. I don't go call him a liar. No, you're from Katy. What are you saying, Houston? I say I'm from Dallas. I don't live in Dallas. I live in Grapevine. I work in Fort Worth. But I use those terms interchangeably because we know the history. And so the biblical authors are also aware of changing history. And so the prophets remember this great event of David chasing the Philistines down. Mm. But they realize uh, Geba's not used anymore. Gibeon's the major city. 
So I'm going to change the name. And we're, you know, one, I'm a believer, so I don't think there's errors in the text. But I'm quite comfortable when I talk to students. I go like, there's not an error here. It's just the history, and we have to understand that history. And so there's so many examples of this in the text itself. We see the biblical writers updating. Uh, this site used to be called this, but now it's called this. Mm-hmm. Another illustration of that is in Genesis 14, right, where mm-hmm. Abraham chases well, after the yeah, cap- yeah. capture of Lot and goes as far as Dan, and yet we know that Dan wasn't even a gleam in his grandfather's yes, eye yes, yes. at that time. But the text itself says that at that time it was called Laish. It was a Canaanite right. town, but they're using the term Dan, somebody updated the text because in that period it made sense. It was called Dan, yeah, yeah but not in Abraham's time. Or, yeah. Yeah. or Genesis 21, you have the land of the Philistines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. And it's, or, and it's uh, Philistines aren't, they're using the language that is right. known to them and not, at a not the time, time, at the time of the events right. described. Mm-hmm. It reflects the usage, the terminology of the time of the writer. Yeah. Are there, since you were responsible for the atlas, were there, did you compile, (laughs) did you (laughs) compile a whole list of those kinds of illustrations when the, the, that would be an interesting study in the Bible? Hmm. I I mean, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, Of course, my area is just the New Testament, not Anson's was uh, the first 16 chapters. And I'm trying to avoid the New Testament discussion. (laughs) Thank you for bringing it back. Yeah. 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 No, I can't um, can't think in terms of, uh, Mm -hmm. off the top of my head, in terms of New Testament, they were pretty well, they're they're current. But we're dealing with a much smaller Smaller period period of time. time. Well, I think we would all agree that this audience is far more educated than the general population. So the pressure's on them. Uh, what was the name of Houston 120 years ago? Who here knows? Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I was a guess. I don't know. That's, I'm an Okie, so I'm guessing. Harrisburg. Harrisburg. So that's only 120 years ago. Yeah. And see, this is an above average group. Right. You well, think. we just prove it's not. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, you know, you got to go with the data. <laughs> so that's what happens yeah, with yes, names. It's yeah. difficult. Yeah. I'd like to uh, ask the panelists to uh, speak to uh, this interesting question. Um, there's been an allusion made to Alat Mazar and her work in Jerusalem. Uh, just, just some random comments as they come to mind. Is, is she finding what she thinks she's finding? Is this... Uh, you know, uh, David's palace, David's uh, administrative building. Are we talking about uh, something to do with the kingdom of Israel and its unified state dating all the way back 3,000 years? Panelists, please. Since this Steve just came from there, why don't we ask him (laughs) what the latest is? Sure, we can start there. Um, (laughs) Elat Mazar came out. She's actually been in Jerusalem and she found some structures. And immediately she came out, and while well, the press came out and said, this is the Palace of David. Um, you can go there, a lot of tourists go there, um, and they go to the Palace of David. Now, the actual structure you're looking at does not date to the time of David. It dates to the ninth century. And so it's not really the Palace of David. Does she acknowledge that? Oh, that yes, yes, yeah, century. in a yeah. report, yeah, yeah. She, you know. Um, yeah. But her argument is within the ruins of that ninth century palace, we know there's an earlier palace. And we have pottery that dates to the time of David. And so this is a nuanced argument, which is why most people don't read archaeological journals, because (laughs) it's so nuanced. And it's an interpretation that I agree with. It's like, this is probably where David's palace is located. It's, it's bedrock, we can't go any lower, but they found pottery historically that dates to the time of David, and then you have this rebuilt palace on it. Uh, this is typical in, in archeology, span all we're doing is removing one building that's built on top of another. Hmm. And administrative buildings tend to stay administrative. Um, so it's, I mentioned pieces of a puzzle. We have these puzzle pieces. So to come to your questions, I think there was evidence for an administrative complex there. And we have pottery that dates to the time of David. 
but that structure that you've taken pictures of for all those who went to Israel and, and stood above it is actually 9th century, the dates of the 9th okay. century. A similar kind of thing, Steve, what about um, the uh, at Capernaum, the synagogue that's there now is 3rd century or so, right? And they say that it's on a 1st century foundation of another synagogue. Would you, is there evidence for that? The Jesus time. If you know anything of the excavations at Capernaum, you know that they're quite controversial. Mm -hmm. Most Israeli archaeologists will not comment on them because mm -hmm. the the dig there was a closed dig, mm -hmm. and so um, the, um, the there is. I mean, look, they have a the, the, there's a historical and archaeological problem. You you have a, a synagogue in which there are coins uh, under the floor, the larger limestone synagogue coins under the floor of the 4th century, late 4th century. So you have the idea is that you have a 5th century synagogue, large synagogue, but that's the same time you have a, this small octagonal church. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to believe that the church allowed them to build this massive synagogue overshadowing the church. So there's, you're encountering a, an archaeological, a historical and archaeological question. What was the function of that, that synagogue? We know that that was a village of... Um, Judeo-Christians, mm -hmm. and Hebrew terms is called Kfar Minim, the, the village of the heretics. Um, the, uh, so it may be that they had a large synagogue there for, uh, there for, uh, for a congregation, a large con a community of Judeo-Christians, but then most people are interested in the, the uh, basalt wall underneath it, mm -hmm. uh, which more or less mm -hmm. is the extent of the uh, the existing synagogue, or at least the main room of the synagogue. The, the, the short answer is we don't know. We have a large structure there. We don't know um, in terms of whether that's, I know there's a sign there that says this is a, for the synagogue of, of Jesus, the synagogue of the first century. But to my knowledge, there's nothing found in there that would sort of answer that question one way or another. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to it. Sure. It's just that you're you're left, and unfortunately, a lot of the, the, the dig there was, Israelis were not so much involved, so they won't, you know, if you ask mm -hmm. someone like Gabi Barkai, he won't yeah. weigh in on it. He says, I have no comments. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it was a closed dig. And so it's, you know, but there is a question of there being an earlier, and that is quite typical mm -hmm. to build. That's one of the phenomena of, of um, the country is that sacred sites maintain their sacred identity. Mm -hmm. Even different faiths. One well, of my favorite one, of course, is at Tel Dan, where you have the Canaanite high place, and you have the Israelite altar, and then you have the later Hellenistic temple. Mm -hmm. All on, and and you can claim that the, Israel, the Israelites knew perhaps that the Canaanites had been there, but there's no way that the uh, the Greeks knew mm -hmm. that this was a sacred site. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that you have, where sites will maintain their sacred identity. So. It, it, it mm. makes sense. I don't have any problem with there being multiple synagogues built one upon another mm -hmm. there. But the, from what I know is that the evidence is not, I don't know, I've not seen or read anything that would sort of be decisive proof of that. Craig, you could weigh well, in on you, that. Uh, Steve, you've sum, summed it up very well. And I've talked with Jim, the late James Strange about right. that. And he felt, um, no, he would agree exactly with what you said. The, if you see the black basalt foundation underneath that beautiful limestone uh, synagogue at Capernaum, you know, you'll notice, especially at the one corner that you walk toward when you enter <coughs> the area, the basalt foundation is not level, and it's out of square. Right. And so the people did masterful work, the stonemasons with the, the limestone synagogue, for the first tier had to get thicker and thicker and thicker in order to uh, be level. That says somebody honored the original foundation and went to a lot of trouble to build on it instead of tearing it out and putting in a good one. So I'm sure there, that's yeah. the original synagogue location. Strange was of, of the view that the, the type of the work done on the basalt foundation agreed with the oldest layer of the house that was mm -hmm. nearby. So he did, or, he did argue for... Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The original foundation is going back to first century BC, and I think Bagatti, way back in the in the decades ago, weighed in on it. That was his his view as well. 
um, I think Mazar showed a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> she had a lot of pressure. She was re reading the biblical text seriously. Yered Metzedot Zion. He descended into the fortress of Zion. And she rationalized that this was a good place to, to look. She uncovered this large stone structure. She took a lot of heat for it. And, but I think she's, she's comported herself well. And I think she probably does have the right spot. This same situation, archaeologists found a structure on Mount Ebal. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible never mentions there was a structure there, but we know it was a site for the cursings and the blessings. And it's a square building, but just hundreds of animal bones there. And uh, Zerta, when he discovered it, he came out and said, well, this has to be Joshua's altar. Now, historically and biblical technically, it makes sense. I think most everybody now would agree that is associated with that event of the cursings and the blessings. Um, a lot will say that's a farmhouse. And here's a secret. All buildings are built square. I mean, it's a steel <laughs> you know, So a farmhouse is going to look like a temple or a structure. But, you know, I'm a city boy, but I, if I was a farmer, I wouldn't let all these dead animals accumulate in the barn. You kind of clean them mm -hmm. out. And the reason you have all these mm -hmm. dead animals is because that's a sign that it was a sacred site. Now, right. that's an interpretation that, you know, there's sacredness here and that they're offering animals mm -hmm. and they're, you know, the offering becomes sacred, so it remains there. Scott, and further indication. Please, you yeah. t t tell us about the bones you're finding at Shiloh. Okay, well, let me comment real quickly <clears throat> sure. on these bones, then I'll transition yeah. to my bones. <laughs> um, them bones. Them, them bones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, Zertal found an earlier round, what he called an altar, at the perfect geometric center of that rectangular structure, mm -hmm. which just supports what we've been saying, that a site continues to be venerated. You know, once venerated, mm -hmm. the veneration continues. Um, now, our bones at Shiloh are very interesting. Of course, in Area D, Finkelstein had uncovered this, this massive bone deposit, only bones from the biblical sacrificial system. In his chronological framework, this had to clearly be uh, Canaanite or Amorite because there were not yet proto-Israelites, I guess he would call them uh, at the time. We're finding two to three times the volume within our regular squares on the northern slope that we have found at other sites that we've dug. And of course, they're all being tested. Tel Aviv University, we're partnering with them, doing all the zooarchaeological work. And we're finding that same profile that matches what the, the bone deposit was in Area D, which, by the way, the, the bone deposit would be floor to ceiling twice the size of this chapel, floor to ceiling mm -hmm. uh, of bones, uh, only from the biblical sacrificial system, full of late bronze pottery. Now, one of the challenges is, is it LB1 or is it LB2? And we don't have much information on that. And so, and, and the bones, they weren't carbon dated, and there's a lot more analysis that could be done. So we're actually planning on getting this stuff out of storage and going back through it with our ceramic typologist, uh, properly extracting some collagen, so that we'll know more, and then we can be more specific uh, in it. But yeah, the bones have a, a real story to tell us, whether they're human bones or animal bones. Uh, hey, my name's Aaron. My question is specifically for Dr. Ortez, but then to be filled in with the rest of you. Congratulations on getting a new uh, provost and president. I'm from Southern Baptist mm -hmm. Seminary. Um, I'm interested in this. Sorry, I'm, I'm interested in the, the statement you made, Dr. Ortiz, about kind of having two roles as a Christian where you affirm inerrancy and then as a scholar where you look at things outside the biblical mm -hmm. text. Have you, have you run into things or found discoveries or what are, what are some examples perhaps where, where maybe your faith has been challenged, not necessarily your faith challenged, but where your, your understanding of the scriptural interpretation has been challenged by something you found, and then you've had to reevaluate this relationship between archaeology and uh, biblical textual criticism. It's not that, I don't want to say it happens frequently, but it, it first happened for me in a classroom in Los Angeles where a professor had me read a book, and it was a Life and Times of Jesus class. And I read this book, and I go like, wow, this is right. Jesus was a heretic, whatever, you know, the book was saying. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me because I felt God was calling me into scholarship. And I go, I'm looking at this scholarship, and it, it's, it just, it's challenging my faith. 
And next day in class, and I didn't know this, but the professor happened to be a believer. And um, other students were upset reading this book. And he said, yeah, I want you to read it to know, you know what's out there. Mm-hmm. And there were several things where, you know, I went back, I slept on it, and I, I went back and I realized some of his reconstructions were incorrect. And he wasn't using the data properly. And so that's more what's going on here. It's you have critical scholars and scholars have a high view of scripture that are debating the puzzle pieces. And it's, it's like, you know, uh, that old game concentration where, you know, they, on a TV game show and you just see pieces and the first one who can guess what the puzzle says. And we're all given our interpretation. And since that point, you know, even with something to question my faith, that I had confidence in God's word that I go, okay, this is uh, incorrect interpretation. Okay, this scholar is manipulating the data. Or we only have two or three of the puzzle pieces, mm-hmm. and I'm confident that when we get five or six more puzzle pieces, mm-hmm. it's going to reflect something different. And so every time I, something that appears that might hash bond, this might not connect, I'm confident in that the Bible is historical and the data will come out and vindicate scripture. Now, in that dichotomy I use is um, the example with Paul on Mars Hill, where he's in a certain context and he's not using scripture, he's using an unknown God. And and that's already uh, a biblical model of how to present faith in a uh, in a non-faith setting, so to speak. Let's thank our panelists for just doing a great job. Thank you.